this message is my testimony. My name is Norman Rocca. I was born in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I grew up mainly in New Iberia, Louisiana. I was born with a muscle disorder known as muscular dystrophy. The disease did not affect me at all during my childhood, and I was completely unaware that I even had the disorder until I was about 14 years old. I was not brought up in a Christian environment by no means of the phrase. My family did not attend church. My family did not live by the principles found in the Bible. My family did not fear God. My family did not obey his commandments. My early memories being around four or five years old were filled with anger, jealousy, sadness. I can remember being consumed by the thought of sex even at that young age. I was looking at pornographic magazines and watching sex on the television and I wanted to do what I seen being done. Every chance I had, I was sneaking off with the girls around my age and experimenting with them, trying to do what I seen being done. At four or five years old, I can remember the anger and jealousy my parents had toward each other. I can remember the countless fights and arguing, with one night in particular listening to a worse than usual argument between them. I know it was early in the morning hours and I could not sleep because of the noise. I heard my dad screaming that he was going to cut his own heart out of his chest and give it to my mother. As I walked into the hall and looked into the kitchen where they were, I seen with my five-year-old eyes my dad holding a big knife to his bare chest as he made these threats. I do not remember crying or freaking out by the sight. I just stood in the doorway of the hall and watched. I watched it all take place as if it was normal to me at this point. As if my five-year-old brain was accustomed to the sound of them fighting and threatening to hurt themselves or each other. My ages of six, seven, and eight were full of parties, alcohol, drugs, perverted people, violence, fighting, and profanity. And unknown to me, I had a disease inside of my body that was slowly becoming stronger and more profound. Yet in spite of all the things I grew up in, I was a happy child. I was content with the way things were. My dad was not always around, but he always found a way to provide for us. We grew up in poverty all of our life. But my dad, even though he struggled with drugs, faithfulness, violence, and the party scene, at those times he never abandoned me and my brothers, to the point of leaving us behind, and for that, I am thankful. I can remember, in spite of all the things I witnessed in my young life, I always knew my dad was somewhere, and I always knew that he was coming back home someday. And I know that's more than some people have. Yes, my dad was not the best dad he could have been, but he was my dad. Yes, I seen him do many horrible things growing up. And yes, I heard him say many horrible things growing up. But he was always teaching us some kind of moral standard. He tried his best to teach us the do what I say, not what I do gospel. He was strict on us and did not spare the rod when we were caught lying or being rude to elders, or stealing, or cursing. He taught us respect and integrity. And for that, I thank him. My mom was caught up in the very things my dad was caught up in. And she was not the mom that she could have been, but she loved us and provided for us. Even though she was not always there, we knew we had a mom and we knew she was coming home. She stayed with my dad through all the bad things life dealt her way and honored her vows to him as she honored her vows to us as a mother. That through thick and thin, good and bad, 
rich and poor, sickness and health. She would be there till death takes her away. And for that, I'm thankful. We always had a roof over our head and food on the table. Even though a lot of the times we were fixing ourselves ramen noodles, cereal with water, powdered eggs, government cheese, and mayonnaise sandwiches. It was normal to us, and it did not bother us. I never remember growing up envying the life of other people who had better things than me. I was living my life, and I was okay with that. Even though the world I lived in and the world's influence around me began to mold me into a wicked human being. At the ages of six, seven, and eight, I was drinking beer and smoking cigarettes. My knowledge of sex, drugs, gangs, and violence at the age of eight years old was more than any full-grown adult should possess. We did our own thing as children because the babysitters we were left with while my mom and dad were gone did not do a sufficient job keeping an eye on us, to say the least. We ran the streets, walked the railroad tracks, went where we pleased, and did what we wanted to do. If that meant climbing into someone else's property and digging around, then that's what we did. If that meant riding around town with a pellet gun, shooting out people's windows, then that's what we did. If we wanted to ride our bikes across town, we did. If we felt like going to the store, we did. I can remember at those ages, I was always hustling. I was always doing something to provide myself with money. We would draw pictures and get the neighborhood kids to buy them. Okay, you want me to draw you a car? 25 cents. No, okay, I, I got some bubble gum in this gumball machine that I got as a gift and it will cost you a dime if you want one and this attitude that I displayed here at this young age would play a vital role in my later teenage years when pictures of cars and gumballs were replaced with crack and cocaine my ages of 9, 10, 11 and 12 were not as much filled with alcohol and cigarettes as they were filled with sex and violence. My heart's desire at these ages was sexual and violent. I was engaged in extremely sexual behavior with girls and engaged in barbaric violent behavior with boys. When the opportunity to be sexual with a girl came around, I was engaged. When the opportunity to become violent with a boy came around, I was knuckled up. At 12 years old, I was living my life as I knew it. In spite of my behavior, my grades in school throughout these years were somehow filled with A's, B's, and sometimes C's. My ability to retain things with limited interest on my part made test taking and passing those tests very easy for me. By the time I was 13, I was introduced to rap music. First time I ever heard or even paid attention to that type of music. And I was rapidly changed by this music. At the age of 13, I began to smoke weed. I smoked weed for the first time and I was instantly addicted to the world of being high on marijuana. I was introduced to the world of selling drugs to bring an income. The muscular dystrophy in my body showed the first signs that went unnoticed as my smile was not a full smile because the muscles in my face began to weaken. By the age of 14, I was handling sometimes pounds of weed at one time for my uncle who also suffered from muscular dystrophy but a much more severe and aggressive muscular dystrophy as he was completely dependent on a wheelchair by the time he was 20. And I stayed with him and was responsible for weighing out bags of weed for distribution. It got to the point where I didn't even need a scale to weigh the bags for me anymore. 
I can simply put weed in a bag and by looking at it and feeling the weight I can tell if the bag needed to be sold for 10, 20, 40, 70 or $200. And at this time I noticed that I could not fully hold my hand straight above my head anymore. My arms were not affected yet, my legs were not affected yet, but my shoulders showed the beginning stage of muscle loss, very slightly. I was brought to Our Lady of Lords Medical Center in Lafayette, Louisiana, where I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. My grades in school went from A's, B's, and C's to all D's and F's. I did not care about people at all or their opinion about me. I was upfront, outspoken, and was at my beginning stage of becoming a menace to society. My 14th year was filled with smoking weed, getting drunk, partying, and just doing whatever I wanted to do. I could still run and jump and move very well and freely at this age. My 15th year was filled with smoking weed, selling weed, taking Laura tabs, selling Laura tabs, riding around with my trouble hungry friends, drinking alcohol and liquid hydrocodone, while attending parties and teen clubs only to start trouble and prove that we were the toughest guys around. At the age of 16, I was introduced to cocaine and I sniffed cocaine for the first time and at this point I dropped out of school completely my entire 16th year is nothing but a blur almost like a dream I can remember bits and pieces here and there but the year was consumed by an everyday non-stop party full of drugs and fast living I can remember being threatened with guns and knives by others while trying to fight. Many nights of my life I do not even remember at all. The muscular dystrophy at work in my body did not stop me at all. If anything, it made me worse. At 17 years old, I was a dangerous person. And I did not care who or what was in my way. If you were in my way, you were going to move. I was violent and I was proud. I would fight a lot and try to get people to fight a lot. To punch someone in the face and watch their blood come out was empowering to me. No one, no matter how big, how fast, how strong, how dangerous, no one could stand in my face, talk down to me, and get away with it. I have been in and around countless fights and bloodshed, I have witnessed and have been a part of the blood of others spilled on the ground and unconscious bodies lying down on the street. And it was normal to me. It was just the way things were. We did what we wanted to do and no one could tell us otherwise. And yet I was very controlled in and around my family members. I was mostly a by myself kind of person. I did not tell my business to everyone and I was not loud with my lifestyle. As many people in my family are completely unaware even of the things I am mentioning in this testimony. And then again there is things in this testimony that I cannot mention. People did not know what I was doing and where I was going. Only the people who were with me at the time can testify of the things that happened. At the age of 17, I was yet downhill even more and was introduced to more drugs. I was selling heavy weed, cocaine, ecstasy, mushrooms. My life was consumed with money, drugs, gangster rap music, with a kill or be killed, get or be got type of attitude towards life and everyone in it. By this point, the only Bible knowledge that I had was that the blank pages in the back of it made some pretty good rolling papers for smoking weed. I had absolutely no knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
no knowledge of what he came to this earth to do and no idea that there was a day for me to stand in front of him to be judged for the things I was doing yet at 17 years old I felt this muscle disease slowly working its way to the muscles of my arm back chest and stomach it was a very slow process and it hindered me only slightly but it was there and I knew that seeing my uncle in his wheelchair that if it got worse and quickly progressed in me then I could end up in a wheelchair also the thought of that made me angry and consumed me with anger it confused me at the same time the thought of not being able to do what I wanted to do the thought of not being able to go where and when I wanted made me very angry so being 17 years old and living a life full of hatred and sin I can remember one night I was high on marijuana and I picked up a Bible I remember trying to read it and I was angry and confused because in spite of my IQ score at the time I could not for the life of me understand what I was reading it's almost as if I was trying to read an unknown language even though everything was written in English I don't remember where I found it but I remember thinking that since there was no man-made treatment for what I have in my body then God must be able to help I had no idea who God was but I always felt there was some kind of intelligent being watching over us I used to argue with people who were atheists that God had to be real every one of us at the time was high on crystal meth and yet there we were having a religious debate on if God existed or not I did not have any intention or desire to give up my sins or to stop living the way I was living I just wanted God to heal me so I can continue my life I can remember being angry that I had this in my body and I had tears falling down my face because I was angry that something was slowly weakening me and I had absolutely no control over it so God was my only option and I remember saying God if you are real talk to me and tell me you're going to heal me silence and as the tears dried up on my face and the room was still just as silent as when I started I walked out of that room more wicked than when I went into it by the age of 18 I was selling weed, ecstasy, lord's abs, mushrooms, cocaine, crystal meth. I was cooking and selling crack. I smoked, I was smoking weed, drinking alcohol, taking ecstasy, partying, popping lord's abs, eating mushrooms, snorting cocaine, and smoking crystal meth. And sometimes I was on all of these drugs at the same time in a single 24-hour period. I was consumed to a very large degree by sexual immorality and violence I was a drug pusher I was a drug user I was a criminal and I was a lawbreaker and I was always associated with criminals and lawbreakers if I seen something I liked I took it I did what I wanted to do and I did it when I wanted to do it I did not work a real job in all of my teenage years. Most of my money came from hustling drugs and stolen merchandise on the streets. My life was out of control every day. Yet I was very strategic about the way I did things as I managed to avoid ever being arrested or even placed in a police car. The amount of time I spent in jail through my entire life put together is only three days. Two days from turning myself in when I was wanted on simple burglary charges and one day for not paying a traffic violation. And I have never been convicted of any of my past crimes in a court of law. It seemed to me that I was outsmarting the law while living my wild life under the radar but unknown to me 
God in heaven was keeping track of all my transgressions, and I was just gathering up for myself wrath by my disobedience. As my years living on this earth hit 19, I have been living a sinister lifestyle for what I call the six satanic years of my life. And when 19 came around, my sinister lifestyle was still getting worse as I was doing more drugs and selling more drugs than ever before. At 19, I was breaking into cars and breaking into houses more than ever before in my past and on my way to becoming a career criminal. And with all honesty, when I would think about my future, I would imagine in my own mind how I would live the way I was living until I was dead. There was absolutely nothing in my mind about changing. Then, in the middle of my 19th year, which was December 2005, I heard that my cousin James Wallen was coming to visit after being in prison for a number of years. My cousin James was in and out of prison throughout his entire life. In my life was kindergarten playground when compared to his. We knew when Jimmy was getting out of prison, then it was party time to a higher degree. Crime to a higher degree. And we only had a limited time to hang out with him because everyone knew it was just a matter of time until he was back in prison. But I heard something was different about him this time around. I heard my family talking about how Jimmy was a much different person from what we knew. My family told me that Jimmy was a Christian. And to be completely honest, I did not know what they was talking about. I remember thinking, okay, that's cool. He's trying to be a better person. But what's that got to do with drinking and partying? Little did I know the direction my life would take after listening to him. The first time I seen him, I could tell something was different about him. Just by looking at him, he looked happy. He looked like he knew something that I did not. Then I shook his hand and I heard him speak. His voice was soft and he spoke to me like he really cared about the way I was living my life. I was confused about what I was experiencing. He was talking about God like he knew him personally. He was talking about heaven and hell. He was talking about Jesus Christ and the devil. A part of me didn't even want to listen to him anymore. But another part of me was very intrigued at what I was hearing. Because it sounded like the truth. And the fact that it was coming from the mouth of literally the worst person my family tree has ever seen made it that much more interesting. I remember my cousin James inviting me to go to church with him, and I really did not want to go. At 19 years old, I had never walked into a church. I had never heard a preacher preach. I never had someone sit down with me and talk to me about the things of God. I never once stepped foot inside of a church, not for funerals, not for weddings, not for baptisms, nothing. But by seeing my cousin James Wallen changed so much, and by seeing him now from what he was before, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that what he was talking about made a very dramatic impact on his life. He did not want to party. He did not want to drink and smoke. He did not want to do drugs and commit crimes. His concern was his family spending eternity in hell. He preached to us all and became known throughout the family as the Reverend. When he was asking me to attend church with him, I was hesitating, but at the same time, interested in that if something had the impact enough to change my cousin Jimmy into a preacher, then I wanted to find out what it, what it was. And on that weekend, I had a choice to make, and that was this. On the one hand, my friends was wanting me to go with them because they knew a computer warehouse we could break into and make some quick money. And on the other hand, my cousin Jimmy 
was asking me to stop living life like God did not exist and attend church with him because he's been down this road many times he knows where it leads and he does not want to see me going down the same path my choice was made and that weekend I told Jimmy I was going with him to church I went with my mom and with my cousin Jimmy and I remember getting out of the car and being very nervous with a very cautious nature I walked into the building I was walking into First Assembly of God on Admiral Doyle Drive in New Iberia which is now named Assembly Christian Center there was a guest speaker that night and they announced his name Ivan Tate we were sitting upstairs and the service began I do not remember all what the preacher was saying but I can remember feeling very condemned about my life and the, and the way I was living it I remember being glued to what Ivan Tate was saying because I just knew it was right even though in 19 years I had never heard a preacher never heard the Bible taught I knew that what this man was saying was completely true I sat through a few hours which seemed like eternity and as I listened to the Word of God I knew he was speaking the truth and at the end of the service when he asked the crowd if anyone wanted to know God on a personal level I stood up and when he asked the crowd if anyone wanted to give their lives to Jesus Christ I walked down the stairs and I walked to the altar Ivan Tate asked me to pray with him and as I followed him in a prayer meaning it with all of my being that if God was real I wanted to know him my body began feeling very weak my body began to feel very warm and my legs began to shake as if I was about to lose my balance I did not know what was happening it was very very weird but I held myself up and I continued praying. At the end of the prayer, I walked out of that church building and even though I was completely sober that night, I felt as if I was on some heavy drugs. I felt as though I was floating. My body felt very light and my mind was very different. I went home and my dad gave me a Bible. I went into my room and began to read and to my amazement I understood every single word I was reading I read and read and read until I fell asleep and when I woke up I continued to read and read and read I was consumed by the Bible I started praying and talking to God and he began talking to me he told me that I was called to be an evangelist and that I was called to preach the gospel every part of my life from that day forward was different and I was instantly turned 180 degrees from my previous life I did not want to smoke drink do drugs or even cuss anymore I quickly became known throughout my family as being a changed person. I was a Christian now, and all I wanted to do was what Christ wanted me to do. No more parting, no more stealing, no more being a menace to society. Well, I was a different kind of menace to society, because everywhere I went, I was preaching. I was preaching to whoever I was next to in public. I was very passionate about the things of God and I wanted to tell the world. I did street preaching. I did street preaching all throughout South Louisiana. I street preached in Houston, Texas, Panama City, Florida. I would make tracks. I made ministry cards. I'd pass them out all the time everywhere I went. I was kind and generous even to strangers 
I would feel the love that God has for the world as I shed countless tears over the sins of people I never met before and over the condition the world is in. I was dramatically changed by my encounter with Jesus Christ. Since January 2006, I have been living a very different life and continue to learn more about Jesus Christ and the Bible as the years go by. I am right now 27 years old and more in love with Jesus Christ than ever before in my life. The muscular dystrophy in my body continues to get slightly worse as the years go by, but I can still walk, drive, work, and I can still provide for and protect my family. And for that, I thank God in heaven. I am dedicated to God more right now than ever before in my life. I confessed my sins to God. I received Jesus Christ into my life. And from that time forward, I have never been the same. My official ministry has begun. And I am convinced that what God has done for me, he is willing and able to do for you listening to my voice. And what God has done for me is save me from my sinful life that was leading me to eternity without him in hell and has granted me forgiveness of my sins while at the same time preparing a place for me in heaven. Throughout the years of my Christian walk, I have had many ups and many downs. It has not been easy. It has not always been victorious. But through faith in Jesus Christ, I made it through them all. My heart's cry is that all people would see Jesus Christ as I do right now and acknowledge him before time runs out. I have no doubt in my mind that we will all die and receive judgment for our actions on this earth. I ask all who listen to my voice to find the truth to this life before it is too late. I know 100% that God is real and his name is Jesus Christ. I know him personally, and he speaks to me, he comforts me, and he assures me that I can trust him with my life. As my testimony so far comes to an end, I ask all who hear my voice to trust Jesus Christ with your life as well, because whoever is in Christ will never die but will live forever and eternity with him. And I don't know about you listening to my voice right now, but for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. May this testimony bless the lives of all who hear it 